Debt can be a terrifying reality. It's something that can hang over your head, and depending on how deep you're in, it can take a lifetime to climb out. Especially if it's a big amount, the pressure is constant, and it's no wonder people sometimes resort to extreme, even desperate measures to escape it. Sadly, this often leads to crossing moral lines, or worse. Today, we're diving into a story from Indonesia in the late 90s, where debt became more than just a financial burden. It turned deadly. This is the chilling case of Astini Sumiasi. It was an ordinary day in Surabaya, Indonesia, February 6, 1996, and the bustling neighborhood of Kampung Malang was alive with activity. Residents were taking part in a gotong royong, a communal effort to clean the streets and dispose of garbage. Everyone was busy sweeping and gathering trash, but amid the routine hustle, one resident stumbled upon something unsettling. Among the piles of trash was a group of plastic bags that looked out of place. They were oddly heavy and emitted a foul stench, far worse than any of the regular garbage being collected. Something was definitely off. Driven by curiosity and suspicion, the resident decided to take a closer look. As they gingerly opened one of the bags, what they saw inside was more horrifying than anyone could have imagined. A human head wrapped tightly in plastic. The sight was enough to send waves of shock and terror through the community. Screams echoed in the streets and the police were immediately summoned to the scene. Authorities quickly arrived, securing the area and transporting the gruesome discovery to Dr. Suetomo Public Hospital. However, without any other body parts to examine, there wasn't much to work with in terms of identifying the victim. The head was preserved, but no autopsy was conducted at the time. The mystery of whose head had been found spread quickly throughout the neighborhood, and soon the story rippled across Surabaya. As the news made its rounds, families with missing loved ones began to trickle into the hospital, hoping for answers. Among them was Agus Perwanto, who had been anxiously searching for his sister, Puji Astutik, for days. His heart raced as he approached the hospital, fearful of what he might find. When he was shown the severed head, his worst fears were realized. It was indeed his sister, Puji. With the victim now identified, the police intensified their investigation. Witnesses from the neighborhood recalled seeing Puji that day walking toward the house of her neighbor, Estini Sumiasi. However, no one had seen Puji leave Sumiasi's house that day, and Sumiasi herself hadn't been spotted in the area since. This was a critical lead, and the police wasted no time making their way to Sumiasi's house to question her about Puji's disappearance. When they knocked on the door, Sumiasi herself opened it. At first, the conversation seemed routine. The police asked her about Puji's visit, but they didn't immediately accuse her of anything. However, what happened next stunned everyone. Without much prompting, Sumiasi confessed. She admitted not only to killing Puji, but also to the murders of two other women. What began as an investigation into a missing person had quickly spiraled into a far more chilling case, uncovering a series of brutal murders linked to a common thread, debt. This is how Astini Sumiasi became infamous in 1996 when she murdered her neighbor in cold blood, simply because she couldn't pay back what she owed. So how did everything unfold and what really happened in this horrifying case? First, let's talk about Astini Sumiasi herself. Born on September 22nd, 1955 in East Java, her early life is a bit of a mystery. 
There isn't much documented about her childhood, but from what we know, Sumiyasi came from a family that struggled to make ends meet. They were at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, and her parents worked tirelessly just to provide the basics. Even then, the family's needs weren't fully met. Sumiyasi wasn't an only child. She had an older brother, and as often happens in low-income families, the older sibling took on a parental role. If you're the eldest in your family, you might get this, having to step up and help your parents by taking care of your younger siblings. But here's the thing. Sumiyasi's brother was still a child himself, which meant that he didn't really know how to raise her properly. Instead of nurturing her, his approach was harsh and filled with conflict. This dynamic created a lot of tension in their relationship from the time they were kids. As you probably know, childhood experiences have a huge impact on how we turn out as adults. Sumiyasi's rough upbringing didn't do her any favors. Over the years, this emotional turmoil led to deep-seated anger issues and impulsive behavior. Unfortunately, these traits would play a significant role in shaping her actions later in life, actions that would leave a dark stain on her name and the nation's history. As Sumiyasi grew older, she worked as a pedicab plastic cover maker, a humble job that kept her hands busy and her family afloat. She married a man named Supilin, and together they had three children. Their life wasn't one of wealth or ease. They lived in a small, crowded house on Kampung Malang Utara Road, a neighborhood that bustled with activity but lacked the comforts many might take for granted. Despite their circumstances, Sumiyasi and Supilin worked tirelessly to provide for their children, embodying the spirit of parental love and sacrifice. Their dedication instilled values of hard work, resilience, and perseverance in their kids, ensuring they would have the foundation needed to navigate life's challenges. In her community, Sumiyasi was a familiar face. She was often ready to lend a hand to neighbors when they needed help, a gesture that earned her a good reputation. But behind that helpful exterior, her anger simmered. Sumiyasi's short temper was something that her neighbors were all too aware of. The slightest teasing or provocation could set her off, leading to outbursts of foul language and explosive arguments. While there's no concrete record of physical altercations, it was clear that her sharp tongue could do plenty of damage on its own. As much as her neighbors appreciated her assistance, they also tiptoed around her temper, trying their best to avoid triggering her wrath. Beyond her temper, another troubling pattern began to emerge in Sumiyasi's life. She had a habit of borrowing money. Time and time again, she would turn to her neighbors, asking for small amounts ranging from 20,000 rupiah to 500,000 rupiah, depending on her needs. This reliance on borrowing wasn't just a one-off occurrence. It became a consistent cycle of financial instability. While borrowing a bit of money here and there might seem innocent enough, Sumiyasi's inability to manage her finances effectively caused significant strain, not just on her own life, but on the lives of those around her who she frequently turned to for help. This borrowing habit came with another, more troubling side. Sumiyasi rarely paid her debts. As her unpaid loans piled up, her relations with her neighbors began to sour. The same people who had once generously lent her money started to grow frustrated. Whenever they approached her to ask for repayment, Sumiyasi would explode with anger, kicking them out of her house and refusing to acknowledge her financial responsibilities. Her stubborn refusal to repay her debts made her unpopular in the community and created tension that was difficult to ignore. Even Sumiyasi herself must have felt the strain as her debts and relationships spiraled out of control. Her victim, Pujia Stutik, was one of many people who had lent money to Sumiyasi. In this case, 20,000 rupiah. While that might seem like a small amount by today's standards, it held much more value back in 1996. 
Puji had gone to Sumiyasi's house that day to demand repayment. But Sumiyasi wasn't able, or perhaps willing, to pay her back. Frustrated, Puji began cursing at Sumiyasi, hurling insults that cut deep, especially given Sumiyasi's already fragile financial situation. And this was the breaking point. The insults triggered an intense rage in Sumiyasi. And in a moment of fury, she grabbed an iron pipe and struck Puji on the head. The blow was fatal. Puji died instantly, her lifeless body drenched in blood. Panic set in, but Sumiyasi quickly dragged Puji's body to the kitchen, hiding it out of sight. At 2 a.m. that night, Sumiyasi woke up, still reeling from what she had done. She went to the kitchen, armed with a large knife, and dismembered Puji's body into 10 pieces. Each piece was carefully wrapped in plastic before she ventured out in the early hours of the morning, scattering the body parts around various locations in Surabaya. The police were horrified as they listened to Sumiyasi's detailed confession. But the nightmare didn't end there. Sumiyasi revealed that Puji wasn't her first victim. She had killed two other women, Rahayu and Sriya Stutik, who were also neighbors that had lent her money. The mystery of their disappearances, which had haunted the community, was now solved. Rahayu had lent Sumiyasi 1.25 million rupiah and was killed in August 1992, and Sri Astutik Vijaya, who had loaned her 250,000 rupiah and again 300,000, met a similar fate on November 1st, 1993. Both women were murdered in the same brutal manner as Puji. The bodies of the two other victims, Rahayu and Sri Astutik, were never fully recovered because of how Astini Sumiyasi disposed of them. After killing both women, Sumiyasi dismembered their bodies and discarded the parts in various trash bins and rivers around Surabaya. This method of disposal made it incredibly difficult for authorities to locate or recover the remains in full which is why only some fragments, such as a hand from Sri Astutik, were ever found. The rest of their bodies were scattered and likely lost to the elements, preventing the complete recovery of the victim's remains. Sumiyasi's confession closed the chapter on these missing person cases. The police, after completing their investigation, swiftly transferred Astini Sumiyasi's case to the Surabaya District Court. On October 17th, 1996, the court handed down its verdict, death. But even after receiving the severe sentence, Sumiyasi wasn't ready to accept her fate. She filed an appeal to the high court, hoping to delay the inevitable. While waiting for the results of her appeal, she was held at Sukun Women's Penitentiary in Malang, East Java. However, in January 1997, her appeal was denied, as the East Java High Court upheld the Surabaya District Court's original decision. Still determined to avoid the death penalty, Sumiyasi took her case to the Supreme Court. But by June 1997, the Supreme Court also ruled against her, confirming the two previous decisions. Even then, Sumiyasi didn't give up. She filed for a judicial review, but once again, the result remained unchanged. The death penalty stood. Her final hope lay in a plea for clemency from the president, but in 2004, this too was rejected. There was no escape. It was clear that nothing could alter her fate. As her execution date neared, Sumiyasi was transferred from Sukun Malang Prison to Madaeng Prison in Sidoarjo. There, she spent five days in isolation from March 15th to 19th, 2005, mentally and emotionally preparing for what was to come. During this time, she was visited by her husband, Supilian, and several of her children. In those final moments, Sumiyasi urged her children to strengthen their faith, to worship diligently, and to pray for her as she faced her impending death. On March 20th, 2005, Sumiyasi was taken to the execution site, 
where a firing squad of 12 personnel from the East Java Regional Police Mobile Brigade awaited her. She was positioned and the squad aimed at her heart. Her body was taken to Dr. Suetomo Public Hospital, where her death was officially confirmed. Even after Sumiyasi's execution, her story continued to haunt those left behind. Rumors of her house being cursed or haunted began to spread. The family who had rented the house in which Sumiyasi committed the murders left it not long after the horrifying events. Despite renovations, no one wanted to occupy the space that had once been the kitchen, the site where she had brutally mutilated her victims. Strange occurrences were said to take place there, further feeding the eerie reputation of the home. And so, the story of Astini Sumiyasi, the woman who killed her neighbors in a fit of rage over unpaid debts, comes to an end. A tragic and terrifying reminder of what desperation, anger, and financial pressures can lead to. There's certainly a lot to reflect on from this case. Lessons about human behavior, the dark consequences of debt, and the devastation that violence leaves behind. Feel free to share your thoughts down in the comments, and hopefully the pain and suffering that the victims' families endured will heal over time. And may the souls of those murdered rest in peace. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay safe out there.